Hello, Dias Merudut in Old Irish means may God be with you. And this is the greeting of the beginning of every conference that you will hear in Ireland from the old world. I want to talk to you today about forest medicine. And as forests are disappearing, the medicine of forests is getting more and more important. It is something that's ubiquitous. Forests are all over the world and are very, are very vital to life. All of us are a woodland people and we have depended for about one million years on the products of the forests. The forests are going right now and we need to know what we're doing. Medicine is measured in units of mercy to the human family since the beginning of time. The knowledge of medicine is important to body, mind and soul on a daily basis. This is true all over the world. The grassroots of traditional or folk medicine has, been, has laid down the groundwork for our surgeries, our burn wards, and all of the multiple treatments found in both public and private hospitals all over the world also today. The knowledge and understanding of herbs is vital to the global population again today. It is very vital to all of us. All herbs, no matter what their origin, have an independent physiological origin in a plant to protect the welfare of other species. This is a product of co-evolution. The real genius of plant-based DNA, and as it relates to human DNA, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. The plant or plant extract is ingested and touches us in a holistic way, one of many in one of many pathways in the metabolic rhythm of the person to elicit a cure in your patient. About 40 years ago, I wanted to take the thinking of medicine combined with herbalism into a different frontier. I wanted to use the airborne medicine, medicinal aerosols given off by a medicinal plant or series of plant families or certain families of trees to improve a person's health. I was also interested in the synergism of chemically unrelated aerosols and how they would boost the immune system and protect this fragile system of protection in people. I was interested in that. And today, as we're speaking, because of COVID-19, this is terribly important. And you are the people with this information in your hands. The immune system in which we also are also interested these days is a very complex system. It is managed in an overall manner by the process of computation called distributed emergent computation. This process, strangely enough, is found in the nervous system, is found in ant colonies, is found in yeasts, and is found in slime molds. And strangely enough, all vascular plants, including trees, use this gene-derived binomial function of command and obey, and obey. Now, if you want to know more about that, I'll refer you to the Global Forest, page 119 to 122, if you want to extend this thinking in your own private area. So to match my terroir, or the ecology of my terroir, or the ecology of my 160 acres, and my climate, my climate is zones three to four. I have a very cold climate here. Where I live, I put in an experimental garden. This I called the North American Medicine Walk. And many, many of these plants are medicinal. Many, many of these plants come from North America. And I was particularly interested in what we are losing from North America. And how I got most of these plants is I wrote for free for the botanical gardens all over the world and I got lists of their species and I plucked out all of the species that were on the endangered list and I put 
the seeds. I only got seeds. I only generated everything from seeds. I put them into the garden. So the idea behind this is very simple. All people, that I mean all people are unique. They're all individuals. They are one holistic unit. A person is a holistic unit or a bag of skin, if you want to really put it that way. With the skin covering that can absorb both fat soluble material and water soluble material. Fat soluble aerosols and water soluble aerosols. Because of the mathematical complexities of human DNA, every person's biochemistry that you treat coming into your clinic, everybody is unique. Even identical twins are unique. Two identical twins, two young people, um, two twins will have an environmental difference on their epigenome. The, the markings on the epigenome gives, gives a difference between the identity of twins. It is also seen, seen on finger, fingertips and the pattern of skin folding makes fingerprinting, that's your individual right there, your fingerprint, as an excellent identifier if you want a, um, a future of crime. <laughs> I'm sure none of us do, but however it's there. Now, listen back. I want you to sit back and just listen to these names. Some, this is not, this is some, this is not all. Some of the important medicinal plants in this North American medicine walk, that's my North American garden, are the following. The balsam poplar, which is very, very, it's called the medicine stick of the boreal forest probably one of the most important herbs on the planet. Its Latin name is Populus balsamifera variety, okay, candicans. Now let me stop for one minute with this. Populus balsamifera variety candicans. As COVID is going on right now, what I use as a herb for myself and all of my friends, I've got them doing this. It, this, this particular tree produces a prostacyclin, prostaglandin uh, compounds in it and they're primary compounds. And what the, the oil of the apical meristem, you take the apical meristem, put it into alcohol, extract it and put it into a fat soluble compound and you put one little bit of the balsam resin on this part of your nose and the other part on that part of your nose. It closes the arterial system to viruses. The next species that's very important um, is the Eastern white cedar. And the na Latin name of that is Thuya occidentalis. That species carries all kinds of medicines for the circulation. It pumps down the blood pressure, it regulates the blood pressure. Um, it's very, very important as an aerosol compound. The next one is the tulip tree. You will know it as Liriodendron tulipifera. That is the magical tree of the Huron people. And it has a compound in it that stops, it's a, a double quinine type compound that stops malaria. And it is also used for the circulation um, by the Huron people. The next one that is very important, and you will never have seen this particular species of tree, it is called the Sacred Tree of the First Nations. And it is called in Latin, Petalia trifoliata. Petalia trifoliata. And it is a member of the family that you're very familiar with, the Rutaceae family. And the Rutaceae family, R-U-T-A-C-E-A-E family, are your lemons, your oranges, your grapefruits. And they have explosive membranes on these fruits. And the explosion of, of the oil-soluble material of them is very, very important for all of your thinking within the herbalist system. But what 
is important of this tree is a compound. It is a synergistic compound. It's called marmosin and marmosinin. The marmosin is a synergist. If I were to give you one aspirin, just for a pain somewhere, I, and I were to give you some of the Petalia trifoliata um, in a scraping mode, from that it becomes effectively to 100 aspirins. The people who are in oncology are really, really interested in this because when you're treating somebody for cancer, if you reduce down the level of your treatments in, by way of molecular, but rev up the system, the, the system within the body, then you get a much more efficacious cure. So this one is a very important compound, compound coming from the trees. And that tree was cut down by all of the pioneers from Florida up into my area here. Um, the shrubs that I have in the garden are the common button bush. That is called Cephalanthus occidentalis, but it is also the butterfly bush for North America. It is not Bodleia. Bodleia is England and Europe. Um, it, is, um, it is the butterfly bush. It feeds butterflies for this area. And all of you, I'm sure, are very interested in having butterflies. But as well as that, the medicine from this is in the old world, the Pai, P-A-I, Chai, Pai Chai from, uh, from China. And it is a hot and hot and heated a method of pain killing for toothaches. So that's an important species. It is on the endangered list here in Canada and you can get it though. Um, the next uh, shrub is the spice bush, Lindira benzoin. And the Lindira is kind of very important. Now, I, what I would suggest to you, Susan, um, is that if you want to make some money, like if you, <laughs> If you're in practice and you decide, well, I want to make a little bit of money on the side, I would suggest for you to do to grow the Lindira benzoin, and that's the spice bush, and you make toothpicks out of the wood. You harvest the wood to make toothpicks. Now, your, your patient's coming in, it stops all the gingivitis, and it gives very, very healthy gums. So that is what the Aboriginal people had done here for generations and generations. And it would be a very good idea. You just make a little attractive bundle of these toothpicks and your patients, it's, you know, for, 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 for very little money, you could do very well, actually. So that's something I'm throwing out there. The main perennials are the Celandine poppy, Stylophorum diphylum. And that was the poppy that the Aboriginal people used for face painting. Uh, paintings all over their face and all over the different parts of their body. But the strange thing about that is, and I don't know if they did know this, is that it is an anti-skin cancer medicine. And a lot of dentists use it for all kinds of things within the dental world. And I would advise you to have that in the garden. It also is on the endangered list. Then the other one is bluebells, Mertensia virginiana. I'm sure all of you down south are very familiar with the bluebells and the wild bergamot. And that's the, um, that's the taste that you put into um, Earl Grey tea, but it's the Alba version of that. So it's Monarda Didyma Alba. So that is the more delicate one with the higher amount of, of, um, of compound in the Monarda. I also have a very large pergola on part of the garden, a huge pergola to the western border. And on that I have the fox grape, the vitus lambrusca, and that produces anti-cancer compounds. I have uh, uh, to the north, I have a chocolate vine, a Becchia quintata, for the smell of chocolate and from chocolate peonies that I have got um, from Cambridge University. And the smell of chocolate is really the base smell in the garden. And the smell of chocolate does something to the sebaceous gland, or not to the digestive glands. It starts the emotion of, of um, digestive juices happening in, in your mouth. And all of the lactones by way of the compounds in the air gets absorbed into your intestines. All of these species that I'm talking about are interplanted with fragrant bulbs like Aurelian lilies, 
all kinds of other lilies, the mono, uh, different kinds of lilies and rare irises. And the footpaths in for walking on the around this area, it's only walking, it's only smelling, you don't touch anything, you just walk slowly around this garden. They're all neutral paths of sand. It's just straight sand that's tamped down, that's all. Of all of the species of the North American medicine walk, they can be mimicked. You can all mimic these using different members of the same family to match your own ecosystem. So you just think about what I have and just block them down. Now these are such a garden, even a small one you can have, can function to relax your patients while waiting for your services. The synergy of relaxation and natural meditation will lower the levels of cortisol, that's adrenocorticotropic hormone in your body, in the bloodstream, and give your patient a better chance of herbal reception for medical relief. So the thinking about that comes from the old world, the old world of Ireland around the time of Christ. This is how they prepared their patients. They relax their patients by meditation and thinking and your cortisol levels go way, way down. And then you're better able to receive whatever medicine you're having. Another suggestion I would have for, is for anxiety. There's a huge amount of anxiety. There is a glut of anxiety amongst all the young people. And I'm talking about teenagers, younger kids. They've got it, 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 it's hugely important in North America. And I really don't know if it's important all over the rest of the world, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was. You use a member and it doesn't really matter which member. If you, you can, a member of the, the, the uh, Saliassier family, that's the willow family. Possibly if you can with running water. So you have your willow and you set up, you can artificially set up some running water. But by a river, by a stream is a good idea. The patient must be seated for at least 15 minutes to relax their furrowed, their furrowed frown. And there are about 22 aerosols released into the air based on the chemistry, the chemical framework of salicylic acid. There are lactones, there are all different, 22 all different kinds of compounds. Some of them are pain relief, some of them affect the body, but they all reduce the ability of anxiety in people. And when they come away, they feel as though they've had a holiday. Now, I'm going to address alpha and beta pinenes for you because all of the clinic, cl clinical, classical research has been done on them. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a must do for all herbalists right now. Alpha and beta pinene require some consideration of all of you herbalists, no matter if you're in Africa, no matter if you're in Asia, it doesn't matter where you are, it doesn't matter where you're listening, please listen uh, closely to this and you can make good use of these. Both of these aerosols enjoy the exact shape of an airborne kite on a molecular level. It's just like a kite flying up into the air. The North American molecular kite flies, oh, I've got, I've got a lawnmower outside the window, flies in a twist to the right, and this is called dextrorotatory. The European species um, twist to the left. Um, and the mixture of the two gives a different kind of flying pattern. The left-hand twist, the European species, the left-hand twists are a much better medicine for the body. They go into the body easier. The dextrorotatory will go in, but the lavorotatory go right in bang like that. All of these aerosol compounds are released in warm weather. So you've got to do it in the summertime maxing out in the summer months for all of you, both north and south of the equator. These medicines are therefore now, these are alpha and beta pinees I'm talking about, fat soluble, and they're attracted to the skin and to the hair. So what you do is you leave your hair down and you leave as much skin exposed as possible. They enter the body through the portals of the sebaceous glands and into the myelin sheath system and into the bloodstream. Now, while circulating in the bloodstream, they fire up the protective T cell ratio of the blood and they affect the neutrophils amongst other 
blood components. Now I'm going to talk to you about the best sources of the Pinaceae family that you can use no matter where you are in the world. Um, but there was one other thing I wanted to say to you about blood components. You can use, you can use the references out of this, um, the medicine of trees that I gave. Uh, it's, a, it's a published lecture, the Hague Brown lecture a couple of years ago, and you can get copies of that and use that if you want to. The best source of pinings for North America of the Pinaceae family here is the Pinus strobus. That's the white pine. Pinus strobus. Now, if you're not a botanist and you want to identify what a Pinus strobus is, you go into the forest and it has a bundle of five, five needles in the bundle. And they should be two and a half inches to five inches long. They are slightly blue green. Now, when you look at them, when you start looking at these trees and you want to harvest from these trees, Will you please choose the blue-green versions of the of the, the pinostrobus for your treatments because they have the highest teeter of both alpha pinene and beta pinene. So for the in the US, if we're going down over the border now, in the US, for you down in the United States, stretching right down into the United States, it's Pinus regida, regida. It's the pitch pine. And the pitch pine is a pine with three leaves in the bundle. But the leaves, when you look at them, are kind of stout and they're very sharp at the top. So if you, if you put your fingers on the top, you'll get, you'll get like a pack of needles. You're, you're poking yourself. And the next one, if you can't find a Pinus regida, the next one is Pinus serotina. Serotina is the pond pine. It is the second best pine. Now, that one, all of those will work for you in the Americas. For South America, the Araucaria, Araucana, and that is the Chilean pine. And the Chilean pine goes from down into Mexico, down into South America. Just, it's very easy to find that pine in the Southern parts of North America. For Europe, those of you who are in Europe, use the Abbey's Alba, the silver fir. The silver fir is a member of the Pinaceae family too, also. Um, and for the uh, for Africa, the Cedrus atlantica, the Atlas cedar. And when you're in Africa and in your the Arabic states and you're in Israel and areas around that, that that is the more northern part of, of Africa, will you please? seek out the Glauca versions. If you're getting seeds of this, that you want the blue green versions of the, of the Cedrus Atlantica, because that will have the highest teeter of alpha and beta pinenes in it. The, bare, the basis of aerosol treatments is old, if not very ancient, actually. It's a very, very old system of treatments. The sweat lodges of North America is one example. All the Aboriginal people use sweat lodge and the heat actually raises the efficacy of whatever species they're putting on the stones. In the Northern European countries, the sauna was the, was the thing that people did. And the ancient Celts, this is before the time of Christ, the aerosol treatments were part of the normal process of medicine for the Celtic community. And the Celts, the Irish, the English, down into even into, into Northern Africa, into Spain, all down into the Ukraine and into Central Asia. They, um, they used another kind of process and it was called Antig Malish. That means in Gaelic, the house of perspiration, which is very similar to the sweat lodges of North America. But the houses were the house of perspiration were designed and met the structure laid down by the Brehen laws. And at the time of the birth of Christ and before the birth of Christ, the law system in Ireland and in the Celtic culture designated you had to have a house of six feet. You had to have two doors in it. And it was attended by physicians, as a matter of fact. So I'm going to have a little drink. And no, it is not whiskey and it is not beer. It's just water. <laughs>
Today in my life, I am seeing a rejuvenation of this kind of thinking of ancient wisdoms. You can find it in the recently published International Handbook of Forest Therapy and the ISBN number, Susan has that. This thinking is being used for schools now, for nursing homes in Canada. It's being used for hospital gardens. I've been invited to design a hospital garden based on aerosols, and this is where you would come in. As well as honoring the indigenous cultures of North America, they want, there's huge gardens going in for the Aboriginal people, and they are specifically Aboriginal uh, trees and so on and so forth because they were a woodland culture. This is inclusive thinking where ancient wisdom is really being ex uh, respected. So it seems to me that the ancient wisdom is coming on board now and it is kind of meeting face to face with science. And indeed the science really does hold, I'm a scientist, it really does hold. And I've spent 40 years looking at this. Finally, I must say to you that I have to be mindful, you have to be mindful of biodiversity globally, all of us, all of you, me, the whole lot of us. In the US and in Europe, industrial farming on a massive scale is cutting a huge swath of disaster for plant life. I don't know if you realize this. There are no borders left for wildlife and that's why we have crashing of all of the insect life. This was brought home for me very recently a Cree chief contacted me. One of his relatives in the city, and that's in Ottawa, was sick. She had some circulatory problems. He needed a, mou a moose mouth full of mature leaves of wild gooseberry, Ribes hertelum, of the Ribes clan. And between us, we figured out that it was one litre, one yogurt litre, you know, and fill it packed down with, with, with these leaves, these mature leaves. It's about, a, you know, how do you, how do you measure a, a moose's mouth? I don't know, it was a moose's mouth work. Anyway, the woman received her three other medications with this one and she survived, she was just fine. And by the way, when he was visiting my gardens, he told me, I, and I didn't know this. I mean, this was news to me. You may know this, but this was news to me, that the Aboriginal people, they cannot collect from the wild anymore because in many places herbicides and pesticides are sprayed. So the herbicides and pesticides are toxic compounds and they change the molecular pathways within plants. I have never given this any thought. So we're taking away from them their ancient medicines too. And if we're taking them away from them, we're taking them away from you too. So it's something really to be very mindful of. And I actually went after that locally here. Um, I tried to get some, tried to change the, the allocation of borderland and my life was threatened. So it can get to be a fire, fairly fiery issue. Um, so that's something to think about. I must say, I was really shocked at that. So many gardens or plots of land you use for herbs are very important and it is getting more important day by day. And I have a very good friend in Harvard, Professor E.O. Wilson, and he says, he said a long time ago, if we lose our plant-based biodiversity, it will be a catastrophe. But I say, if we lose the ability to heal ourselves, that will be our catastrophe, and we see it today. So that's the end of it, Susan. And we can go and gas bag about all kinds of other goodies. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Um, when I was, you know, trying to decide what the theme of the International Herb Symposium should be yeah. uh, in the thick of COVID, it, it, it was very clear to me that the focus needed to be on the forest. And in this time um, of COVID when, when everything kind of stopped and gave us a moment to really re-examine um, what yeah. we're doing to the planet. Uh, we, we've, we've had a, a lot of discussion, but very little of this discussion um, other than in the climate realm has focused on the rate of deforestation uh, yeah. at a planetary level and also how the increase in zoonosis diseases such as COVID and viruses that yeah. transfer from animals to people 
is um, deeply intertwined to mm -hmm. the lack of forest and the rate of deforestation we're experiencing. So for me, yeah. um, there's there's a, an interconnectedness as you so um, eloquently described how trees relate to our immune system and yeah. how our uh, human health is completely um, intertwined with the health of the planet. And it's how, not the mercy of the planet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess I, uh, you know, would, would like to ask you to, to speak to some extent about how significant um, the boreal forests are to the planet. Um, and mm -hmm. as you had, had mentioned yeah. previously that um, the boreal forests are, are perhaps the most intact functional forest that we have left and, yeah. and, and yeah. how that relates to the other forests, how it relates to the clouds, how it relates to um, addressing some of the, 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 the climate crisis that, that, that we have to um, take action on um, yesterday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and that little warrior, Greta Thunberg, I mean, yeah. she is a cracking little girl. And I mean, she kind of woke up the world to this. And this was part of the legend, really, in a way. But first of all, let me let me let me interject a few little things before I talk to the boreal. Um, I, I, I imagine that all of you know this, but in case you don't know this, you need to know this. The forest, the mantle of the forest is on planet Earth. And the mantle of the forest took about 400 million years to be put in place. It took a very, very long period of time. Prior to that, the carbon dioxide atmosphere, we had a carbon dioxide atmosphere equivalent to Mars. Life wasn't possible on this planet. So it's taken 400 million years. So what have the trees been doing? The trees have a genome similar to our genome. Their DNA is similar to ours, except for two bases on the ladder, two climbing bases, that's all. There is no other difference between them. There is a recognition between our bodies and our culture to a forest. So what does the tree do? Like, what are trees doing? They grow. If you're sitting in a garden and you're smoking a cigarette or you're smoking a cigar or you're having a whiskey or whatever you're doing, you look at this tree and then you come back in a year's time, the tree has grown. You haven't fed the tree, you've done nothing. You've seen this tree in front of you. How come it's growing? How come this tree is actually growing and blooming and producing a huge canopy? Well, I'll tell you how come. 40 years ago, we didn't know this, but we know it today. The tree's canopy tracks the sun and it farms the sun. The trees actually are smart enough to farm the sun. The sun produces gamma radiation. The gamma radiation comes down on the canopy of a tree, all trees all over the world. And what they do is they, the, the canopy plucks carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. The energy of the gamma radiation of the sun chops the carbon dioxide into two, into oxygen and into carbon and, and water join, bangs on with the carbon and that goes into the body of the tree, making the tree grow. So when you're smoking your cigar, you see the tree growing. This is what's happening. We didn't even know from a molecular point of view that this was what was happening. But 60 odd percent of all of the oxygen you breathe today all of, all of you who are listening today, 60% of that oxygen comes from the trees, comes from the forest. The oxygen is O, is an atom of oxygen. It joins with another atom to give a molecule of oxygen. And molecule of oxygen is O2, and it floats in the atmosphere, and it's recycled and recycled and recycled. For millennia, millennia, and millennia, you may have Stalin's oxygen in your blood today. You may have the Pope's oxygen in your today, or you may have your 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 hated mother-in-law, your father-in-law. <laughs> oh, sorry, baby, you're breathing your mother-in-law's oxygen today. So this is what's happening. We didn't know this. And what happens by way of structure in the canopy 
it's it's a quantum field it's a quantum mechanics it is very 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 interesting because einstein didn't even know that existed he knew there were sine waves he knew that that was happening he knew that light came down in a sine wave and a straight line vector but the sine waves is like a beehive. The sine waves land on the leaf, boinga, 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 boinga. And that's how photosynthesis takes place. My God, we'd never knew this. So this is a new revelation really for all of us humans. So we've taken down the trees. That's the molecular machine. And now we're going to really spin our wheels on this one because climate change is coming. Now in the whole of the world, in the whole of this marvelous world, I am putting it this into your laps. You're the herbalists, right? You're the people. You know about plants. You have the feeling of plants. You have the feeling of plants in your heart. And in the old world of Ireland, you'd say tot tot the gum. There is a feeling of emotion towards plants. That's called tot. There is no equivalent English word for it. To and tot the gum. So what I'm saying to you, you become some warriors for protecting the forest too, before I say any more because we have very little forest left, as a matter of fact. And I wrote that book, Arboretum Borealis, A Lifeline of the Planet, because I wanted to protect the boreal forest because it's the last forest system left in the world. And what is rare and unusual about the forest, that forest system is that the angle of light, because you have a circle, the, the, the earth is a circular, approximately a circular shape with a bit of bulge on the tropics. Um, the angle of light coming in is very low. Those trees up in the boreal don't get a whole lot of light. They're lean and they're mean and they pull all of the photons out of the air as much as they can. We cannot rebuild the boreal forest because it is a unique genome and it has a unique terroir and it has a unique ability to conduct the weather weather patterns of the world. That forest up there produces a lot of what's known as hydroxyl groups. You smash your water into hydrogen and OH, the OH groups go into the air and that initiates the weather patterns for the whole of the world. We can't rebuild that forest. We can't do it. We have got to stop cutting that forest, no matter where it is in the world. It is in Canada, it is in the United States, Northern United States, going over to Europe, it is Finland, Norway, Sweden, all of the top of the taiga of Russia, the top of the taiga of China, going down into the north, most northern island of Japan. The Sakhalin Islands is also part of it. And then going along into, um, well, I've kind of swung around the world there, all of the top. It's like a crown on the world. It's like a whole crown on the world. It is unique. But now let me tell you another thing that's unique. When you've been out collecting your herbs, when you've been out collecting and doing things, you, I'm sure, I'm sure have noticed that all species on the margins protect themselves. There is an entity of identity within the plant system. There is an identity within the tree. There is a knowledge of self. It's just like you and me, when we go down for a walk down the street and you know, you're know you moaning and groaning about something that happens and you're talking to yourself, well, not, not quite in words. I mean, we're not in the lunatic asylum here, but you know, you have a chat with yourself. There is an identity of self within self. You give yourself permission to be who you are. But I think the same thing happens in trees. There is a unity of self within trees, within all of the plant kingdom. And that speaks to us actually on a daily basis. When something is put into the margins, it produces better medicine. And the margins of life are up in the boreal forest. The, the Pinus banksiana, the Scots pine, is the part in, in the USA and the part in Canada, Scots pine. But it tracks into the Pinus, the Sylvestris for all of Europe, for all of the taiga, for all of Northern China and Northern Japan is the pine. And of course the Sugi in Japan too. Um, in, that is the equivalent to the Pinus banksiana. You cannot remake that system for the production of pinenes. You cannot reinvent that forest. 
We do not know how to do it. We think we're so smart. We are not all of us scientists, all of us people in universities. Hey, we're not as smart as we're telling everybody that we are because we cannot reinvent that. And the best, the finest, the most quality, quality um, medicines come from there. And let me talk about one thing that you gentlemen and ladies should know about is one of the species I talked about that I have in my North American medicine walk is the Populus balsamifera variety candicans. That one comes from the boreal forest and it is their most important medicine. That medicine can do something and it is in great plumes and swaths, those, those aerosols come around the world in the spring. In the springtime, I'm talking to all of you people, in the springtime, like today, you feel good, right? Your kids feel good, your parents feel good, everybody feels Why in hell's name are you feeling so good? Like, what's happening here? Have you ever asked that question? It is because there's an effluence of, of prostaglandin, prostacyclins, all of the name prostacyclins coming in a northern swat of cold air down into the south, into the warm air, and there's a mixing taking place of bloom. What that does for you ladies is it changes your oxytocin levels in your body, your ability to perform in bed, and for the gentleman, it also changes the ability of the arterioles in, let's say, the penis, because I'm sorry, it is a penis. Um, it actually strengthens it like Viagra. And that makes a man feel very good. It enables his masculine hormones to actually change and feel good. Does the same thing for children. Does the same thing for, for, for people as they get older. This medicine is prima facie. It is the prime medicine there is. It is very, very complex medicine from this plant. Um, so far as I know, in an organic lab, no, an organic chemistry lab, I mean, nobody has been able to manufacture that because it has, it has four dimensions in its movement. It's like a clock. It's an extraordinary form of medicine. And what I was saying to you earlier on, Susan, is that it is the opulum balsamifera, a, a cousin of that balsamifera, was used to be found down um, in Jordan in, and in Israel. And it was, the, 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 it was called from the tree of Mecca. And at the time of Christ and before the time of Christ, it was like an oil, like myrrh and frankincense. It was used all over the world and it cured so many things. And, and, and people at the time of Christ were pretty smart people too. I mean, they're not idiots. Um, they called it the, the tree of Mecca, and it was a rave medicine that was used even into northern India. And I have some kids in, in Jerusalem. I have some kids in Israel and some kids in Jordan looking for that. And it's, it's down, it should be found down along the pathway of the river. And just in case there's some people from that part of the world, I um, maybe visiting that area. Now, let me tell you what you would look for. You would look for um, a, like a spike of it. It, would, it will be a tree in the future. It, it produces it clones underground, that particular species does. And it was bombed out in the last couple of wars. It was bombed out and destroyed. But I think the cloned root is still there. So if you're walking along the water, water the rivers of the what's the Jut Still River or something, walking along the rivers, you find just a sprig of it looks like a branch coming out of the ground, and it has leaves on it that are are simple leaves and a serration around the leaves. That will very possibly be the balsamifera species. And if someone of you find it, for God's sake, will you take a cutting of it and you put it into some water? And when you put it into some water, then you take a cutting of a weeping willow. Will you please do that? A small cutting, put it into the water. The weeping willow will produce auxins and it will make root formation grow on the balsam poplar. So there you have a glorious tree. You will have some of the most valuable medicine in the world. So now uh, let's go to the boreal. It is all the species on the margins. 
even the yeast in the boreal is different. The yeast is a black yeast in the boreal and it is a Saccharomyces nigra. And that is a very, very valuable yeast. There are so many valuable things up in the boreal forest. There are, There is a double forest there. There are the trees and there are the shrubs, of course. But then you have all the cladonia. Then you have all of the lichens and all of the lichens spill or solic acid into the air. And have you ever wondered why the air is so clean? Why your lungs actually can breathe the air, even though sometimes in some places it's really crappy. It's because of the ursolic acid in the boreal forest. And the whole area is carpeted. It is immense with fruiting bodies. I mean, you when I was filming up there, and, and you'll see the film Call of the Forest, you put down a foot. I mean, I'm a botanist, so I love all of these, all of these lichens, right? So you put a foot down, you think, oh my God, where will I put my other foot down? Because I'm going to squash something in front of me. So you're terrified to walk around. It is phenomenal. There are specialized um, lichens that even go with the inside of skulls. Like if you murder somebody up there, okay, and then their flesh is eaten away and a skull is left, there's a specialized lichen that goes into the skull. There are specialized lichens all over, all over the boreal forest, but they pump out our solic acid and it's an air cleanser. So where would be we be if there was no oxygen? and then the air wasn't clean. So now if you don't believe me, I will ask all of the audience to stop breathing for a half an hour. So you better phone up your, your undertaker because you can't do it. And if you can breathe, if you can breathe right now, thank a tree. That's just that simple. And in particular, you thank the boreal forest. It's just that simple. That simple, it's that simple. <laughs> I was I was just thinking when you were when you were saying all that about the um, about how you know a common name of of the the poplar is is the balm of Gilead and I guess I hadn't yeah. put that together but I it it must um, it it's um, such an incredible sap I don't even know what you that that yeah. it, that it produces it it heals the skin I mean it's yeah. it, um, uh, and, yeah. and incredibly Im important medicinal and, and, and I guess uh, grows in, in many regions around the world. That's right. And the more northern, if you have altitudes, high altitudes, you can grow it very well. Mm -hmm. And if you happen to have horses, um, you'll find the horses are always chewing the bark of a balm of Gilead, Gilead, you're calling. You're not going to get colic in your horses. Yeah. The horses are curing themselves of colic. So don't drag your horses away from these trees. You just kind of, well, I don't know what you're going to do. You're going to have to plant a few more if you have horses. Mm -hmm. But the horses love the Balm of Gilead. And I mean, that should tell you something. And in the spring, you can get the aroma. I mean, the aroma in the air is just absolutely gorgeous. But it isn't just aroma. It is these prostaglandin compounds. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just so good for you. Right. Well, I think it's fascinating, right? Because we have... Um, I think really, you know, relatively new research that is, is looking at these, um, you know, medicinal compounds, and then there's also yeah. these medicinal aerosols, and then our understanding of how, um, the forests are, are communicating yes. um, with each other through their, yeah. um, through their fungal networks, My sharing in mycelium, yeah. sharing resources. My and then we're seeing all these, um, you know, um, overlay to understanding our immune system. And then, uh, and, and then yeah. we're, and then we're learning about um, how the mycorrhizal, the mycorrhizal system under a tree mm -hmm. is equivalent to your intestinal flora. Right. Which is, I yeah. mean, it's, it's amazing. It's Maybe. amazing. And, and, yeah. and then you take it, you know, to the, to the next level of, of, of the communication that yeah. that's happening. Um, and, and so how, and I, I, you know, like you, you mentioned many times, I mean, really this conference is, is for herbalists and herbalists yeah. are innately yes. attuned to the properties of plants. We realize that we don't, we don't have many antiviral medications. We, we mostly yeah. have only the, the, the ability to create vaccines to help our, our body react mm -hmm. to the virus, but yet plants 
you know, are experts yeah. at, at yeah. producing antiviral compounds, whether whether you mentioned the pine, you know, thyme mm-hmm. that people can grow in their, their garden. Um, there's, you know, just an abundance of, um, of antiviral compounds in, in plants found in all over the world, even with the most basic yeah. common herbs to the complexity of these um, in, incredible uh, tree species. So it's, yeah. I really feel like it's the message of our time to, to all, um, you know, kind of dive deep into the school of the forest. I don't, I don't know what else mm-hmm. to call it, but it's, um, it, Oh, it, you're right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. And there's another thing that maybe you the audience don't know a lot about are bacteriophages. Bacteriophages are the most numerous species on earth and they were only discovered about 10 to 15 years ago we didn't even know they knew they existed and what happened is they somebody it wasn't me uh, i can use an electron microscope and i've used it quite a bit um they sheared sea water just across the um the stage it's called the stage and you gold coated and car- carbon coated first and then you gold coated and then you scan the area and they found these rocket look, rocket-like looking creatures on the water, and they're tiny, tiny. They are, I think, they are ten to the, are, they're the most numerous species, ten to the one hundred and thirty, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they're, they're the most numerous species on Earth. We didn't even know they they, they existed. They're in the they're in the mycorrhiza of the ground. They're the things that. Um, that in Russia, all the scientific labs in Russia are such experts on, they can, they can cure all kinds of viruses in different areas of Russia. And there's kind of things called sacred ground. Now, all of you people listen carefully to this and keep your ears open. There are sacred grounds all over the world. I think, I think mm. these sacred grounds have a high, high teeter of bacteriophages. Wow. So when you're told about these sacred curing, healing grounds, don't start laughing. This is this is serious stuff. So what I do when I'm planting an unknown species, because I always get it from seed, I take a little bit of soil from here, from the under the pine trees, under I have a huge arboretum of all the different trees, and I combine it with um, compost to get the mycorrhiza going. So when you're when you're cooking mushrooms or any of the different mushrooms in your kitchen. Always save a good bit of the butt of a mushroom and make sure it goes into the compost. Don't eat it. Just share that with the soil. Share that with your land. Put that out so that generates hyphae in your compost. So then you have a huge amount of mycelial. And that the more mycelium, the more communication you have and the more ability to grow and the healthier your plants are. So that's a little trick that I have as a gardener. Um, that I use in the garden and you use it in your vegetable garden too. So um, it, it makes everything healthier. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, well in our um, uh, list of, of presenters for the conference, we have a few um, different people presenting on different sacred groves and, and sacred forests around the world. And and absolutely, I mean, I, I've often thought, you know, these these sacred groves, these sacred places are are, are often where these incredible medicinal plants can also yeah. be found. Um, yeah. uh, very similar to the to the church forests that um, are throughout Ethiopia, um, they they really become these islands of of biodiversity um, that have and the Shinto been, shrines in Japan. Yeah. Same thing. And mm-hmm. in Ireland, if you're going in Ireland, listen to this. No, C O I L L is quail in Gaelic okay so if you're going look at the look at the map of Ireland and if you see K-I-L-L Killarney Quill Quill is the ancient name for an ancient grove okay so even in Wales even in Scotland and if you're traveling you see C-O-I-L-L or K-I-L-L that is an ancient grove there were ancient groves in that area and you start sniffing around in those places and you will find something really unusual so sorry for interrupting. You. <laughs> no, 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 that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, I, I I just want to thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and knowledge. And I I certainly plan to have um, you know resources that you've suggested to me to make them available. Yeah. And uh, I just wonder if, if if you have any closing um, remarks as 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 we um, end I our do. discussion. 
Yes, I do, actually. Um, and that comes from my recent book. And the soft copy is going to be out in October um, the, to speak for the trees. When I was a little girl in Ireland, I'm a member, I'm, I'm an, a mongrel, okay? Like I am really am a mongrel. I have ancient Irish aristocracy. My family lines are very, very old. 3000 years is my Banshankas, is my pedigree. And on my father's side, they were all, you know, they're related actually to the royal family, to Princess Di and Charles and God knows all of those people. So um, when my family was killed, I was put into, I was supposed to be put into um, a school for would, would be children who, who had got pregnant, um, children who were orphaned. I was supposed to wash the clothes of the people of the city. And so the judge, he called me into his chambers and he said, I'm going to lose my job because he said, your father's family is too powerful, which, it, which they are, and they're a really nasty bunch of people. So he would have lost his job. So I, as a child, was put into the hands of a bachelor uncle at 11 and 12 under the Brehan laws. And then I was taken into the, the given all the ancient wisdom during the summertime uh, under a Brehan wardship. But at the end of the three year wardship where I was given, you know, the Onoigam Kreev, which is the, the original, the language you and I are speaking today, Susan, is based on trees, is the alphabet of the trees, is, is the basis of the language. And when I, um, when they were finished with me, they asked me to go and to get educated as, mu as much education as I possibly could. And they told me that the time of now, and this is this, this year, this day, this time, they, they told me there would be terrible trouble in the world. And they, I, I, I was not, I was expecting things like COVID actually, that I was, I was told to, par to partake on, and to give out my, my wisdom at this time because it would be needed. And I was told then that I would be the last voice of the ancient world of Ireland and that there would be no more after me because I was given instructions in Gaelic. That means that means I'm speaking. They were speaking in Gaelic to me and all the Gaelic things. And I have been very faithful to that. And I didn't really quite believe it when I was, you're a little kid. You, you think, oh my God, how can this be? How could these people die? You don't even believe that these 70 and 80 year olds will die. You think they'll they live forever for you, but they didn't. And then all of the things that were forecasted for me, all of the things, and, and there's a whole line of prophecies that I was given. Um, they're, they've all come true. And I have been faithful to this sacred trust. And I feel very honored that I do have an audience and that people like you and all of your audience are listening to me because this is serious business. Yeah. This is not business to be playing about with. We are very serious about this. And um, all of the medicines in Ireland, old Ireland, medicine was never crossed to hand with silver. That means the medicine was an inherited. It was an inherited knowledge from family to family to family to family. I have been faithful to that and I've been faithful to it in my sciences and in all of my academic world. I refused a professorship of medicine so as to do what I'm doing now because I think this is very important. I think we need to protect the future for the people of the world, the future people coming. And we need to be very careful about it. And we need to get together. And I was told that we would hold hands across the world. And I thought, how the hell can we hold hands across the world? I mean, it's not, we're, we're, but we're doing it right now. Yeah. The thing I was told that we would do and that the, the people of vision, that now, that the time of now will also be a time where people will have vision. And I see that happening now because COVID is forcing people to be alone. And when you're alone, you go into another form of, of ter therapy, which is, uh, uh, it's called a stillness in, in old Gaelic, on soundness, on soundness, quietness within you. And out of that becomes creative meditation and creative meditation actually builds character and the building of character is building in the children right now and they will benefit from that in the future because yeah. it makes them steel like and it'll sturdy them and the same for all of us so we will be more convinced and more knowledgeable of our planet when this is all over and we won't take it for granted anymore yes. see i like that <laughs> <laughs> i um 
I, oh, I guess it's not, I think if I hold it in front of me, here's the book um, to speak for the trees. And I, I, I cried, I smiled. Um, it was such an inspirational story. And I'll just read this um, paragraph from your introduction, which says, Trees offer, a, offer us the solution to nearly every problem facing humanity today, from defending against drug resistance to halting global temperature rise, and they are eager to share those answers. They do so even when we can't or won't hear them. We once knew how to listen. It's a skill we must remember. And um, so thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I'm hoping not only um, is this the, the kickoff keynote to the International Herb Symposium, but it, it'll be a, an online learning um, platform for people around the world to connect to each other, especially young people. Um, yeah. and, and it'll continue. It's not just a weekend event. It'll, it'll, it'll keep going on and on and, and uh, empowering people with the knowledge and, and education that they need to, to speak for the trees. So um, thank you so much, and, and we'll, we'll end it there. Uh, thank you, and my heart is with you. And thank I wish you all the best for the conference, and I'll be thinking of you. Okay. Thank you very much, Susan. Yeah, thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> <Bye. laughs>